Good morning and welcome. Welcome to all who are present, to all who will be uh, uh, watching and worshiping with us on Facebook and YouTube, uh, to the folks at Greencroft and to many others uh, who bless us by their presence and by their attendance. Uh, we're very thankful for this opportunity to come before the Lord and uh, thankful for the, the efforts of so many uh, to bring us together. Uh, this is the time we're going to be sharing now our, our candle lighting. <sighs> Today's message is a reflection on the need for rest, relaxation, and peace. As these candles are lit, let us peacefully open our hearts and minds to the Word of God, allowing God to speak, to be silent, and to be present in the moment. Hear the words of Psalm 25, verse 5. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. What came into your heart when those words from Scripture were spoken? What thought came to mind? What could God be saying to you right now? Listen again to the words of Psalm 25, verse 5, and this time call to mind one word which stands out for you. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. What word came to mind as this verse was read? What does this word mean for your life? How is God speaking to you in this word? Once more, listen to the words of Psalm 25, verse 5. Listen to your heart as these words are read. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Make me to know your ways, O God. Teach me your paths. 
Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love. Now let us, let us pray. Speak to us, God, who is found in silence and clamor, in peace and tumult, in rest and haste. Speak to us according to your will and open our hearts to your spoken word, your written word, and your spirit word. This we pray, that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Our hymn this morning is number 614 in the hymnal. In the bulb there is a flower. Well, we are going to share a unison offering prayer. Please pray with me. Receive our gifts given today, given earlier this week or month or year, as we set in motion the mechanics of paying automatically or digitally and given respectfully, graciously, and happily. In giving, we proclaim our faith in your work, O oh God, and our belief that in your time, your will shall be done on earth as it is in heaven. May your Holy Spirit guide the living of these gifts in the world for the good of the world, as your Spirit guided us in our giving. This we pray together with faith, hope, and love. Amen. Well, let's uh, share our children's story at this time. So I'd like to invite any children that would like to come forward to do so.
Good morning. I think one of us is lighter than he was last week. Is that right? Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. Might be missing a tooth there. You, you make it look good. Well, let's fold our hands into our Bibles. This is the Bible. We'll open it wide. There are many stories of people inside. Big people, little people, like me and you. We'll listen carefully to hear what they do. Well, today, story is called The Friends of Jesus Pray Together. Uh, your picture comes from one of the paintings that's at Camp Mac, uh, which is our camp, and you'll get a chance to go there someday, I think. Now, after Jesus went back to heaven, his friends stayed together in order to pray together and study the Bible. They knew they would be doing work for Jesus, but first they needed to pray. It's the same for us today. 300 years ago, the people that started our church also met together. They knew they would be doing work for Jesus, but first they needed to pray. They needed to read the Bible. After prayer and Bible study, they went out to do work for Jesus. We do the same today. We come together for prayer and Bible stories. We are getting ready to do work for Jesus. And the Bible verse is, all were united in their devotion to prayer, and it's from Acts 1.14. So I want to give you a copy of this picture and story. Here's one. And invite you to go to Sunday school now. So thank you for coming up.
Well, our um, scripture this morning comes from the beginning of the book of Acts, uh, uh, where Luke writes, Theophilus, the first scroll I wrote concerned everything Jesus did and taught from the beginning, right up to the day when he was taken up into heaven. Before he was taken up, working in the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus instructed the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed them that he was alive with many convincing proofs. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, speaking to them about God's kingdom. While they were eating together, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. He said, this is what you heard from me. John baptized him with water, but in only a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. As a result, those who had gathered together asked Jesus, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel right now? Jesus replied, It isn't for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has set by his own authority. Rather, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. After Jesus said these things, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going away, and as they were staring toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood next to them. They said, Galileans, why are you standing here looking toward heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they entered the city, they went to the upstairs room where they were staying. Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, Alphaeus' son, uh, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, James' son. All were united in their devotion to prayer along with some women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Uh, well, this is the summer uh, time for some of us to take vacations, to get away. Uh, but regardless of when you do take some time off, how many of you have come back from vacation and said, boy... I could use some vacation to get over the vacation. You know, in a way, we feel guilty about not going to work, and so we have to justify it by using every second. Uh, what is it Rudyard Kipling, if I remember correctly, in his poem, if said, if you can fill the unforgiving minute, with 60 seconds worth of distance run, then yours is the earth and everything in it. We need to use every second as if we would have to justify ourselves and account uh, and in some ways apologize for those moments when we simply sat still. Now, we probably come by it naturally because if we look around at the natural world, certainly we see this frantic, this frantic need to, to find food, to eat food, to be uh, protective, to on the, be on the lookout for predators and, and not to be prey and, and, and to worry at all times that death could spring upon us at any moment. Uh, you know, the, the uh, more recent animal documentaries are a little different than, uh, than Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, where all the animals talk as slow as Jim Fowler, you know, and uh, uh, nothing bad ever happens. Whoops, the lion did not catch its prey today. Maybe tomorrow. You know, the animal always gets away in the old Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Nowadays, not so much. So we understand, and yet... Even in the natural world, which is a matter of life and death, we see all of God's creatures 
sleeping, taking time to do nothing, not trying to fulfill some purpose. I like to go out in the yard and watch my honeybees at work. I say mine, I don't own them, but it's how we think. The, the one hive, they leave the hive heading out in the southwest. That's their direction. Their flight path takes them that way. The other one is to the southeast. Maybe they have their own uh, air traffic controllers. And there are times when I'll you know, face the hive, see that they're going over my head, and turn around and look on the incoming path as these bees are invisible, then suddenly are speeding past me. They have things that they need to do. They're coming back with with nectar and with pollen, and, and they've got to get back there because, you know, summer is this frantic time to, to collect honey. The average honeybee will collect one-twelfth of a teaspoon of honey by the time the nectar is uh, cured and, and thickened. In their lifetime, one-twelfth of a teaspoon. And when you consider that... Uh, Two years ago, I got 90 pounds of honey from the hives, and last year, 60 pounds, and I left them plenty besides, uh, probably the same amount or more. Uh, You know, you realize that it's taking a lot of bees, a lot of work, to make all that honey. And yet, even bees sleep six to eight hours a night. Now, the older bees are like older folks. They don't need as much sleep. They might sleep a little less. But now that there are cameras inside hives, we see that bees suddenly stop in the middle of a day and do nothing for five, ten seconds or five or ten minutes. That it's okay, even in their frantic world, to do nothing. And when I read this passage here, Jesus is giving them the great commission you know, a tremendous event has occurred, which we really have to, we're so used to talking about the death and resurrection of Jesus that we need to put our minds back into that situation, the, the impossibility, the, the incredible message they are being given to share that Jesus is risen and that it is their testimony. They're not going to be able to drag Jesus along with them. Their testimony is what's going to make this come alive for people. This this is such a tremendous task. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, then in Judea, and then Samaria. We're getting into enemy territory. And finally, to the ends of the earth. When you're facing a job that big, you'd better get started. But what does Jesus tell them? Don't do anything. You are entering a time where you will stay put until the Holy Spirit sends you out. Jesus gives them permission, and as it says here, they went back to the upper room where they had been staying, and they all gathered together in a community of prayer. Jesus set an example for rest throughout his ministry. He kept trying to get away to pray and to cease doing something. Now, that was hard for his disciples to handle. They kept looking for him and trying to find him. But Acts chapter 1, verse 14, is a way of saying sometimes we have to wait. Now, we've been looking at this upper room. Three weeks ago, I spoke about the upper room as a place of hospitality, this upper room that is owned by Mary the mother of Mark, who at that time would have been a boy, Mark, the author of the Gospel of Mark. And it seemed to me that this was likely the place where when Jesus and other Galileans made the three-day trip south to Jerusalem for the Passover, they would stay in the big city in a friendly place. This is a place Jesus seems to be familiar with, and in his boyhood, we're told in Luke chapter 2 that he came there every year. You know, once you find a place in the big city you like, you keep going back there. Once you find a place to sleep where you feel comfortable, you make the same reservations again and again. 
And so this is first a place of hospitality where when the disciples ask, where are we going to have the Passover, which is like Thanksgiving. It's, it's a meal that you share with friends and family wherever you find yourself. Jesus says, well, just go look for the place where the man is carrying the, uh, the, wa- the jar of water on his head instead of the woman. Because that's where it, Mary, we think the mother of Mark, has an upper room, a very large upper room, where everybody can eat and sleep and spend time. And then we find, as I preached last week, that it's a hideout. That in our own lives, there's a time when we simply, we simply can't face the overwhelming weight of events. Sometimes we need that hideout. Sometimes we need to provide that hideout for others. But there's always a time when it's simply too much. This week, we see the upper room as a harbor. The harbor is where the ship comes to from its very important journeys to be refitted, repaired, replenished before the next voyage. If you don't kick the tires, even though boats don't necessarily have tires, how are you going to know if it is seaworthy? We have to stop and take time, we ourselves, to have our own tires kicked, to rest, and as it says, to pray. You know, prayer is more powerful than we know, and the reason we don't know is we can't always see what's happening. We don't see the machinery at work. It is a mystery to us not knowing what effect it is having and when the effect will become apparent to everybody else. We often overthink prayer, too. We sometimes think we need to speak in, in, in golden words that will impress God, when God is all the more impressed when we, can, when we have no words. And like the Pharisee in the parable says, doesn't look up to heaven, but simply says, Lord, be merciful unto me, a sinner. There are times when... We come forward in prayer and don't need to say anything because we're letting God speak for us. I know that I find prayer more like breathing. I don't worry about words so much as just just constantly being open. Thoughts and words flying up and recognizing that if you're not silent at some point during the prayer, you're not leaving much space for God to talk to you. The upper room becomes a harbor in which they're refitted and also in which there's time for relationships to be repaired. One thing that's clear in the Gospels is that Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the brothers and sisters of Jesus weren't always fully supportive of his ministry, tried to bring him back home to fulfill his duties to the family. But we see healing because they are here in this room. One of the most important things we need to do during a time of harbor is give up. Not give up our plans, our hopes, our dreams, our discipleship, but give up trying to figure out what's next. We want everything very clear. We want to know what it is we're going to be doing and what results we will get. We want to know exactly what it is we're going to be doing and what results we will get. But you know, the big things in our lives, even when we thought we were getting ready for them, we had no idea what it was going to be like. If you have had children, you know that Everybody's a much better parent before the kids come. And once they did arrive, after reading those books or listening to the advice of others, you suddenly realized this isn't at all what you thought it would be. But we rose to the occasion. It's the same other big things in our lives, getting ready for a new job, beginning a new relationship, walking into a new restaurant or discovering in your good old church that there is a new thing for you to be doing. 
Either way, give up trying to know exactly what's going to have it and have it all charted out. And be prepared for miracles. The disciples could not have known in advance that when the Holy Spirit finally did come, when after a time of harbor they went out into the world, that Peter was going to speak and that people were going to understand them in their own language and that they were going to be far more successful. As a congregation, as we prepare to harbor some refugees, we have some good people here that have, that have done their studying, have worked hard to get all their ducks in a row, all the time knowing that in a way we can't possibly know what's going to happen or, or what we're going to need because we won't know till a week or two in advance who they are, where they're coming from, how many there are, and what their needs are, how well they speak English or don't speak English, how many generations, or whether it's just one individual. So all we can do in this time of harbor is to pray, to do the work we need to do, and then just wait, knowing that when the time comes, with the help of everyone in our congregation, we will come through. Uh, don't feel guilty if you have time to catch your breath. We all know times come when we're too busy to do that. So use time, the time of harbor in a free and accepting fashion instead of feeling guilty or apologizing for it. And in your life as well, Plan for vacations where you don't need a vacation to recover from the vacation. Or at least build in a day or two for when you return. And don't be afraid in the midst of a really busy day to do like the bees do and just stop for a little bit. Because you'll be back at the front lines. This is the natural order of things. We all need that time of harbor because the Holy Spirit is with us. Jesus has promised us the Holy Spirit and there will come the time when we will go forward full speed ahead. And when we do, because we have taken the time to pray and to what to the world appears like we're doing nothing, that God is ready to lead us out of harbor and back into this wonderful voyage that we are sharing. Amen. Our sermon hymn is number 301. 301 in your hymnal. Joys are flowing like a river. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4. Joys are flowing like a river. Together.
This week's prayer focus is custodians. In Romans 12, 2, we read, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, on the basis of God's mercy, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. What does reasonable act of worship mean? And what does it have to do with custodians? Well, I think I'd translate the Greek word logikon as sensible. As for worship, the Apostle Paul is using the word latrian, from which we get both the words for liturgy, which is the order of worship, and latrine. I spent some time with my copy of the Cambridge Greek lexicon, and basically, outside of the New Testament, this word means menial labor or slave labor, gritty, gutty, and entirely necessary. In a religious sense, it refers to the person who cleans up God's temple. For us, we are reminded we can't have church if you don't have clean bathrooms. Or at least you don't want to. During the height of the pandemic, we thought of those who worked in health care, criminal justice, food service as essential workers. And we asked them to put their lives on the line, staying at their posts while the rest of us stepped back and isolated. We celebrated those people and thanked them. But everyone working as custodians or janitors who however you want to put it, were also doing their part because they were as essential as anyone. As Christians, we go one step beyond the word essential. Doing custodial work for our church, for our homes, and for all of creation is sensible worship. Sensible worship. We have hallowed this idea by following the example of Jesus in washing the feet of others. We live it when we do the tough jobs, the dirty jobs, the essential jobs, which are essential worship. Keep custodians in your prayers this week and thank them as well. And now our benediction, after which we'll have our benediction song. So worship team, come on up. Thank you for always being ready to Run on up, regardless of what order I actually do the things in the order of worship. (laughs) Be God's witnesses here at home, in our community, and throughout the world. Amen. All my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm gonna sing wherever I go. All my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm gonna sing wherever I go. God is for me.